Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching pastor here. Welcome to Crossroads. I'm going to be actually up for the next four, well, five weeks uh, doing this series that you're probably going, what does that title even mean? Free your father. Well, I'm going to explain it over the next few weeks. Um, The basic premise is this. God wants to set your family free from generations of addiction and sin and dysfunction. And he wants to make you the one that is the voice, the, the voice that says, hey, that stuff that was back there in our past, it's been forgiven And now it's time to live a different life in our family. And we're going to live in our family a different way. So you're saying, well, my, you know, my kids are already out of the house. Listen, wherever you are in life, if your kids are out of the house, uh, if you don't have kids yet, this message applies to you because this message is actually the more I've been preparing for it, the more I say, wow, this is the message that God has called all of us to share with our world that we're in right now. So I'm going to unpack that today. Um, When I was, I think it was like six or seven years old, my dad, we, we, our family was on a family vacation. We were driving through Alabama. And he said, hey, we're going to take a, a little detour. Um, and I, and I want to tell you what this detour is about. I was like, oh, I'm, you know, detour didn't bother me. I was six or seven. He said, you're going to meet your grandfather. And I said, wait, wait, my grandpa? My, my grandpa lives in Illinois. Is he going to come down and meet us in Alabama? And he said, no, no, no. You're going to meet your real grandfather. The guy that was actually my dad but I haven't seen him in 20 or 30 years. I said, wait, what? That's when dad first told me about growing up. His, one of his earliest memories was his real dad. He was a raging, drunken alcoholic who, uh, his, my dad's, one of his first memories is his mom locking him in a shed in the back and saying, be quiet. Your dad's going crazy. His dad walking around with a gun, screaming my dad's name, saying, I'm going to kill you. And my dad was watching him through the, through the cracks in the shed. And that, this shocked me because if you looked at my dad, you never would have known that he came from that background because he had made some very different choices for our family. One of the choices, well, I'll tell you about that in a minute, but he had made some very different choices. And uh, I didn't even realize that his mother divorced from this crazy man early on as a child and that she married a new man and that man actually chose to adopt my father. And so all the time I was growing up, I mean, up until I was six or seven, you know, you feel like you're really old at seven. I thought this was my real grandpa, but I remember this being a moment where all of a sudden I looked back and I thought, wait a second, my, f- my family's got some jacked up stuff in it. <laughs> and, and here's what I know about everybody in here. If you're a human being and you look back at your family line, there's some messed up stuff in there. There's some people in your family history who go, wow, uncle so-or-so, or maybe that person that was so messed up was your parents. And you all of a sudden had this moment, we all have this moment where we look and go, wait a second, my parents aren't perfect. Because here's what naturally happens for us as we're growing up. So Blaise Pascal, one of my favorite things he said is this. He said, there is a God-shaped vacuum. Sometimes they translate this as there's a God-shaped hole. But it's really is a vacuum because it's just constantly sucking for more. It can never be filled. It says there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man or woman, any human, which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God, the creator. This is why you see people that say, I got all the money in the world and I thought I had everything, but I still wasn't happy. I got the girl, I got the guy, but I still wasn't happy. There's this thing within us that's always saying, I need something big to fill my heart. And for some of us, that big thing that fills our heart is your relationship. And that's why some of you have been bouncing from one guy to another or one girl to another. And every time you like, you break up with one and immediately you jump back into a relationship because you're like, it hurts. I need this. I need something. I need someone. But yet the person never, and you just keep getting more and more hurt, but the person never fulfills what you're looking for. This is the reality once you get married. Some people get married to to cure loneliness and then they find out they're more lonely after they were married than before. Because here's the thing, that, that, that sucking sound in your heart, it can only be filled by something really, really, really big, infinitely big, and that's the love of God. And if you're trying to fill it with money or what you attain or who you know, you're always gonna be disappointed. 
If you're, if you're thinking your spouse can fulfill that need, they're never going to do it. At, on their best day, they'll never be able to fulfill that thing in your heart that's saying, I need, I need, I need it. And, and God put that in there because here's the thing. He wants you to need him. Everything within you is calling out for God to fill that hole in your heart. And that, that stuff you're trying to fill it with, the alcohol, the drugs, the relationship, the pornography, working your brains out 18 hours a day, whatever it is, it's not going to work. At some point, you're going to look around and you say, I still feel empty because only God's love can fill that. And here's the thing. As a kid, even as a kid, your heart wants that. You're looking for God even as a kid. And what happens is we get our first ideas about who God is from the first God-like figures in our lives. You know, as babies, we're super helpless. My brother bought, brought his one-month-old baby to our house the other, uh, yesterday, and I, I just was reminded how helpless kids are. They need you for everything. They need you for everything. And, and it, uh, as kids, we look to whoever feeds us, changes our diaper, takes care of us as this godlike figure. But what we eventually start to realize, wait a second, those godlike figures in our life, they're not perfect. They've got some flaws. And when we start to look at that, it can be disappointing to us. And we go, Man, they didn't give me what I needed. And, and, and the really challenging thing is because our first images of God come from whatever God-like figures in our life, whoever's caring for us early on, it may have been an aunt, an uncle, a father, a, you know, a mother. You know, your father may have ditched you. Your mother may have ditched you. It may have just been one parent. But you look at them and you start to see them as God. But that can be a real problem because here's the thing. Your, prob your parents have the same problem you do. They're flawed. And they can never give you everything that God's perfect love can. And it really gets challenging because what happens is sometimes we start to look and we see this, this is how we would describe our parents. Some of us, maybe you look at your father and you say, well, he wasn't bad or mean or anything. He just was never around. He was always at work or he was always watching TV or he just wasn't really there. He was kind of distant. He never really talked to me about anything in life. And Maybe that's your view of a father and you start to kind of maybe project that on God and you start to see maybe that's who God is. You're like, well, maybe he's just kind of out there letting the world spin and I'm not that important to him. And, you know, maybe that's how you see it. Uh, passivity. Uh, this is one of the things. And again, you're going to hear from my father at the end of this series. He'll correct everything I told you that was wrong. Okay. But he's going to share at the end of this series. But one of the things about my dad, which is the blessing about him, but it's also the curse about him, which is typically what happens with our parents, is the good thing about him is also the thing that bothers us about him. Uh, same thing with your spouse. Remember that thing you married them for that now drives you crazy? Right. He's so fun loving. Now you're like, well, I wish he would take things a little more seriously. Right. It's, it's the way it is. Anyway. Maybe he's just passive. This was a challenge I have with my, I realized recently when, as I was preparing for, for this message is my dad's been passive and I would watch. Sometimes in life, I, I'd be facing these struggles and I'd be like, dad, come bail me out. And he wouldn't do it. But like, when's he going to bail me out? And he never would. And afterwards he'd be like, you, le you learned a good lesson from that. And I'd be like, that didn't help when I'm in the pain of it. And I realized that I, sometimes I look at how God is. That's one of my biggest issues with God personally, just to be vulnerable with you here, is I no, God loves me. I don't doubt it. But I wonder how much pain he's going to put me through while he's watching from a distance. All for my own character development. And I worry about that with God. I'm like, yeah, I know he loves me, but man, his love sometimes looks really brutal. But I realized I got that from seeing my dad be that way. And now I have a great father, but here's the thing about it. Your parents are never perfect. They're flawed. Maybe your parents were harsh or self-serving. They're just mean. I said mean, horrible things to you. Things no parent should ever say to your kid. Maybe they were just all, all, all out for themselves. If they were narcissistic, they're so absorbed in taking care of themselves that they never, uh, everything they did for you was actually for them. Maybe you had a parent like that. Or maybe it was a parent that was impossible to please. And, and you're, maybe you're a man today and you're still trying to prove to your dad you're enough of a man and he's been dead for 10 years. And what ha we all have these images of what our parents were and this reality of it. And we don't like to sit around thinking about it. You don't sit around thinking about how bad your parents were, but it's, it's, it's this weight you carry with you around. And some guys, I've even heard them say this. I was on an, a podcast the other day and they had a, they threw a question out I wasn't prepared for, but the guy said, how do I keep from turning into my father? 
I was like, man, a lot of people say that. How do I keep from becoming my father? Because we're very prone to become what we saw growing up. And that's really what's challenging about this is as a kid, you don't get to like see anything different. Your world is, is your home, what you see. And it's not until you get into your 20s, maybe, and you go, wait a second, there's other ways of living around? Like, not everybody lives that way? And, uh, and you, you start to think, well, maybe I was lied to about that. Man, Santa really doesn't exist? What is this? Like, I was totally lied. That was a joke. Anyway. <laughs> we start to realize, oh, there's different ways of living. There's a guy named Robert Kiyosaki. He wrote a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he basically said that people who grow up with parents who have money learn things about money that people who don't have money don't learn about. And so if you, until you learn it, you just don't know what you don't know. Until somebody that understands how money works explains it to you, you don't get it because you just didn't get that growing up. And sometimes you maybe feel robbed because of your upbringing. You're like, they didn't teach me that. Well, maybe they didn't know it themselves and they couldn't give you something they didn't get themselves. But all this is to say that at some point we have to face this reality. This verse says it all right here. Romans 3.23, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God intended glory for us. But when Adam and Eve took the fruit and ate it, it says we all fell short of the glory of God. Our whole family line, our fathers and the fathers before them and the fathers before them became corrupted. And this is super important to recognize because this is one of those things that a lot of people are like, wow, why you gotta be so negative and down? I said, because here's the thing, in order to understand the good news, you gotta understand the bad news. And the bad news is this, Every one of us within us has a potential to do some really bad, horrible things. Now, we may justify it and we say, well, I'm not as bad as him. I haven't murdered anyone. But deep inside, we, we have to recognize that we've all fallen short of what we're, we were made to be. And this is really what's concerning to me right now in our world, okay? And this is super, super important, okay? When you don't, Refu or when you refuse to acknowledge humanity's sin problem, it's foolish and dangerous. And this is where, I'm gonna be really practical with you today, okay? Because one of the things that concerns me in our country today is this. We, in many ways, are turning a blind eye to things that make us uncomfortable. And we become naive and prone to being abused, prone to being taken advantage of, prone to being used by powerful people because we're naive and we refuse to look at negative things and we refuse to look at the negative side of human nature. We say, well, we assume the best about people. But you know what Jesus said? He said this. He said, you've got to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless or innocent as doves. And I see a lot of people that they see what's going on around them and it makes them uncomfortable. And they're like, well, I'm not going to mess with that. They refuse to believe that maybe powerful people in powerful positions in government. Well, they would never lie to us about something as important as public health. Never. Right? Because people are generally good, right? No. Think about yourself. If you had some privilege or something and somebody was trying to take it away from you, you'd use whatever means were necessary to take something from you, to keep people from taking it from you, right? Wow, the social media platforms would never truly ban something that's important for people to know about. They would never do that. And yet it's happening. Yeah. And you get written off as they're conspiracy theorists. But here's the thing about conspiracies, guys. There's usually a little truth in them. And the Apostle Paul says that all truth that we see, any truth we see, we see through kind of these hazy glasses. And so you have to be constantly seeking out truth. At any point you think you've got the truth, it's probably not the truth. You got to stay humble and realize there's deeper layers of truth. And what's really concerning to me is a lot of people in the name of not facing the discomfort that somebody might be out to do evil things for them, evil things to them, we just ignore it. And evil things start happening. And this tide comes and we don't push it back because we refuse to acknowledge that in everyone's heart, there's all this wickedness. Now that's the bad news. And I'm, I'm gonna go to the good news now. Well, first I got a little bit more bad news. Okay. <laughs> there's this theological word, it's called depravity. Depravity, we don't usually walk around saying depravity, but depravity means this. It means that we within us 
are completely incapable of doing anything that's good apart from God. And it's a reality of the human existence. And, and here's what's really tricky about the human heart. In Jeremiah, it says, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Some of the people who do the most evil will do it in the name of what they think is the public good. And we should be very concerned about this because there have been so many horrible things done in the name of the public good. A guy named Hitler, he decided to eradicate the Jews in the name of the public good. And good, wonderful people just like you and me participated in it. You say, how could people like that do something? Like, how could they participate in that? Well, first of all, they, blind, they turned a blind eye because it was uncomfortable to think that someone would actually have evil intentions. They turn a blind eye and all of a sudden the evil people go do rampant things because we don't want to recognize that all have sinned and we have a tremendous capacity to do horrible, wicked things and we'll justify it. And we as Christians, we have to recognize that at the core of every human, man, you got to love everybody, but you also got to recognize you can't trust them. You say, well, Jesus would never teach that. <laughs> Actually, it does. He did, he did teach that. There's this verse that it says, I should have put it up there. It says, but Jesus wouldn't trust them. He wouldn't entrust himself to them because he knew what was in their wicked hearts. Even Jesus, who loved everyone, said, I love you, but I also know you can be a nasty little goober. <laughs> and that's what it looks like to be as wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. You have to recognize that evil does exist and people will do all sorts of evil things even in the name of good. And they're like, this is for the public good. I'm a good hearted person. Don't you trust me? Well, you've also got some motives you don't even want to recognize. Like your kid's going to an Ivy League education and if you say something that doesn't fit in with the propaganda that's coming from certain government organizations, you might lose your position and then your kids can't go to the Ivy League. This is very real stuff that's happening in our country today and I'm not trying to get political. I'm just saying, don't be naive. Because naive people get abused and then they can't stand up for the people who are being taken advantage of. You've got to be wise. And this is, there's no time like right now to get up, wake up and say, I don't, but here's the discomfort of it. When you see something just uncomfortable like that, you got to do something about it. But here's what we've got been called to do about it. Because here's, here's the good news in all of this. We are all wickedly depraved. There's so much potential for evil in our hearts. And you start from there. You start from the bad news so that you can really understand the good news. And this is where the good news comes in. Sin is rampant throughout our family lineage. Your parents were sinners. Their parents were sinners. Everyone around us is sinners. We're sinners. But as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin... Interestingly enough, a lot of people say, well, wasn't it Eve that sinned? I, ha I have my theological stances. The sin actually happened when Adam didn't stand up and do something about it. When he passively took the fruit. Women are like, yeah, it wasn't our fault. Those guys. <laughs> That's my stance. You can argue with me whatever you want. But I think the sin st happened when Adam, there's a lot of weight on men's shoulders, men. There's a lot of weight on our shoulders. When, when the man didn't stand up. So anyways, there's my theological stance. You can argue with me later about it. I'm right. But, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. And you say, well, I didn't sin. Adam sinned. Yeah, but you got to it pretty quick. How, how old were you before you started? You, you started sinning pretty young, right? It happens. There you go. I didn't, I didn't sin. I wasn't born into sin. Okay, well, whatever. But you have sinned at this point. So we've all, we're all in the same situation. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. This is a big theological concept here, but it's basically saying this. God gave us the law, the Ten Commandments, to show us that we could not do good because here was the standards and we couldn't reach it. But he said, I know you can't reach the standard because you all have these hearts that you can't even tell when they're doing good or bad. You think you're doing good sometimes and you're actually doing bad. It's that bad. But he says, Adam to Moses, even, uh, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam. He says, Adam, you know, Adam had a certain sin, but others have done other sins. We've all got a whole, we are really creative sinners. We've all come up with all sorts of wicked ways to offend God. And he was the type of the one who was to come, but this is where things start to turn for the good. But because of one man's trespasses, death reigned through that one man. But 
Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace through Jesus and the free gift, I added Jesus, we're going to get there in a second, the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus came and rescued us from sin. He freed our entire lineage right back to our father, Adam. He came and lived the perfect life and made the sacrifice. So therefore, as one trespass, trespass, that just means sin, led to condemnation. Condemnation means you're guilty. God says, you, you did it, man. I've seen you. I see everything you do. I saw what you did. It says, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. And here's what justification is. Because of Jesus, when you accept his gift, justification means when God looks at you, it's just as if you'd never sinned. Just as if I'd never sinned. He looks at the perfection of Jesus. His blood, it's a weird image, but it's his blood. He covers you and all Jesus says, God sees is, ah, oh, that's, my, that's my perfect son down there. I heard someone say that one time that uh, there's this verse that says, God gives you a brand new name when you come to Christ. And, say, and it says, and only God knows the name. I say, well, why would, why would only God know the name? He said, because here's the thing. The enemy is called the accuser of the brethren. So he comes and he says, man, God, do you see what Joel's doing down there? You say, well, I don't know who Joel is. Joel died back there when he gave his life to Christ. That's another dude, and I ain't going to tell you his name. Because you can't accuse him. Because in Christ, it's taken care of. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Adam messed it up for us all. But by one man's obedience, Jesus Christ, the many will be made righteous. So we're forgiven of our sins. And this is where the role comes in of what you have to do in this part. You couldn't do anything to get your salvation. You couldn't do it. You weren't good enough. You couldn't rescue yourself. You couldn't rescue your family. Jesus rescued us and he rescued our family line. And here's our call now. It says this, if you're in Christ, you are a new creation. This is from 2 Corinthians 5. It says the old has passed away. What you were, you're not identified by that anymore. You carry it around in your mind, but God doesn't even think about it. So you need to start thinking like God. I'm not that addict anymore. I'm not what I did. I'm not my past. I'm who God says I am, a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this, this is from God. It ain't from you. You couldn't have done it. You couldn't save yourself. It says, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation is there's conflict in the relationship and somebody comes and says, you guys need to learn how to get along. And they figure out a way to say, to make the wrongs, write it, to right the wrongs or forgive the wrongs and bring it together. And that's what he says. Now, here's the thing. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Through Christ, God said, all right, I'm not mad at you anymore because of my son, Jesus, if you'll accept the gift that he gave. I'm not mad at you. I was mad. You really messed things up. But I'm not mad anymore because I sent one man, Jesus, to redeem and free your family line. And so it says this, so not counting their trespasses, their sins against them and entrusting to them the message of reconciliation. And this is the good part. This is where your part comes in. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. God's not mad at you anymore, family members. God's not mad at you, world. Now you come and surrender your life before him and he's gonna forgive you of all of the things you've done all those wicked, evil things, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He will forgive you of that. And we now are these ambassadors. I have a friend, I went to Israel a few years ago and he was working for the embassy, working for the ambassador there. He let me borrow his car. And I was like, hey, what do I do if I get pulled over? What do I show them? He's like, you won't get pulled over. I was like, what? He said, no. He's like, when you're in that car, you're in America. That car is the property of the United States government and they cannot do anything to you in that car. I was like, dude, I can, I'm free to do whatever I want. And he's like, don't do whatever you want. He's like, you're a representative of America in Israel in my car. That's what Paul says. He's like, guys, you guys are totally free. But don't be using your freedom to do stupid stuff. Be an example of righteousness. And that's what he's saying. He's like, guys, you're set free from the, from the, sin, that you, the sin that you did. You're set free from the ultimate penalty for that. Sometimes we pay some consequences while we're cleaning up the mess. But you're set free from that. So act like somebody who's set free. Not like somebody in Grand Theft Auto, right? <laughs> Drive the car with wisdom. We implore you. And, say, and that's, our, that's our message, is we're called to go 
and tell the world, you're set free in Christ. Now live in freedom. And that's where this message comes in of rescuing your father. You're like, what is Pinocchio doing up there? <laughs> We've been set free and now we're called to let the rest of the world know that we've been set free. And a lot of times what that means is recognizing the effect that sin had on you on your, in your past through what your father did, what your mother did, and going back and saying, I recognize they were sinners just like I am, but Christ set me free and I'm not going to live in the bondage of what somebody's sin did to me. And again, don't, don't get caught up in saying, oh, can I set, you know, can I, can I atone for my father's sins? No, each person has to do what each person is responsible for God, but you can make sure that those sins don't continue affecting your family and your family lineage. And that's what this series is about. And there's this crazy verse as I was preparing this message. It's in Hebrews. It, it, it's, it blew my mind when I read it. Because in Hebrews 11, Paul, he talks about all of these heroes of the faith, Abraham, Moses, all these guys, you know, the stories you read in the Old Testament, he's like, all these guys, they were like heroes of the faith. It says, all of them lived by faith and they pleased God. But then it ends in Hebrews eleven thirty nine. It says this, these were all commended for their faith. All these guys I just listed, all these names, man, Barak, uh, Jacob, Israel, hey, all these guys. He says, but none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Like, whoa. What does that mean? Now, there's some deep theology in there that's way above my pay grade, but here's, here's what I've, I've, I've extrapolated from it. When Jesus came, these guys that were heroes, they, were, they came before Jesus and they were living by faith the best they knew. But there's something that happens when we become those ministers of reconciliation and we complete the work of those who came before us, the things that they could never be, we say, they never were that. My father never was what he should have been. My mother never was what she should have been. But by the grace of God, I'm going to be what they could not be because God is going to be moving our family line forward. We're going to be advancing. And that's what I think he's saying here. He's saying, because of Jesus, we can go further than those who came before us because we are messengers of reconciliation. We are ambassadors of the fact that God is not angry at you. He's forgiven your sins and we don't have to live in the bondage of sins, of those addictions, of those past histories, of the things that our parents did wrong, the things that affected us, the sin that was on us. You don't have to live under that. You can break free from that. And that's this weird verse that says, and through, through us would they be made perfect. And I don't understand all of it, but there's some element of the fact that when you step out and you become all that God intended for you to be and you break free from what's been holding you back from your family line, we walk in the, this perfection that God has for us because that's how Jesus sees you. He sees you as, as perfect. God sees you as perfect because of Jesus, not because of anything you've done. Remember, your heart is deceitfully wicked on its own. So this, this next few weeks, I'm gonna be talking to you about three, three specific things that I, I believe we all have to, mindsets we have to do. You know, half of life is learning and half of life is unlearning. I'm gonna be talking to you about some things you're probably gonna have to unlearn over the next few, few weeks to, to break free from, from that and set a new standard for your family. And, and here's the good news about all of this. You can be the one that breaks the cycles in your family. You can be the one that sets your family on a new course for the future. You can be the one who acknowledges the negative things nobody wants to look at, says, I'm not letting those have an effect on me anymore. I'm not going to be that. I'm not going to be what my father was. I'm going to take the good from what my father and mother were and I'm going to get rid of the bad. I'm going to eat the fish and spit out the bones. And I'm going to be what they never could be. I'm going to be the fullness of who God intended me because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you know what that means? It means God intended you for something glorious and you can live up to that because of Jesus now not because of anything you've done. You have the capacity to live free in this unfree world, but it takes acknowledging the negative things, acknowledging the fact that there is wickedness and evil in the world, but recognizing that you are an ambassador of the light in this world. And it starts at home. You guys receive that? All right. Let me pray for you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. 
or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.